Happiness in India is mostly economic. Don't believe the gurus who tell you happiness is a state of mind. And if they still insist, ask them to talk to a housewife who's living a life of depression and in bondage, unable to feed her four children. I have a very simple proposition here for each one of you. How about rupees 100,000 into the bank account of every household every year? No questions asked, no strings attached. I can see most of you are already excited. Some of you are still not breathing hard. But imagine, just imagine if this proposition was made in a small town called Kachwa, about 30 kilometers from Banaras, or even in a smaller town called Pulia, or somewhere in a slum of Hyderabad near home. For the next 15 minutes, friends, we're going to talk about a very, very special initiative that we've been working on, and it's called Universal Basic Income. In the layman's language, it's something like getting money for free every year. No questions asked. Now, this idea may sound far-fetched, but Universal in Basic Income is one of the most hotly debated policy themes going around in the world. It's a theme which seeks to address the issue of poverty, inequality, and several others, like life-changing events of layoffs, of drought, and other disruptions. Like most hotly debated topics, the truth is somewhere right in the middle. UBI has many cheerleaders, and they come from different ideologies. Some of them talk about the challenges associated with the implementation of UBI. Some, th some of them talk about the benefits. Some of them talk about the features. But friends, we still have many people who question the ideology itself. UBI is a concept where most of them talk about the society about the community. They talk about what can UBI really do for the people who are really deprived. The capitalists have viewed UBI as a road leading to communism, and the communists see the whole thing as the death of the welfare state. But like most debates that I mentioned about, the truth is somewhere right in the middle. Yes, the basic income seems to be having its moment now. Today, it gets a knowing nod and not a puzzle glance that we experienced three, four years ago when we started working on the concept of UBI. The critics of UBI need to appreciate and understand and accept even that UBI is not a gender obligation. It is not an attempt to avoid the revolt of the masses. Giving money free to everyone sounds crazy. It sounds morally coercive and it sounds extremely expensive. What's really incredibly expensive is poverty itself. As some of us grow rich, most of us are getting poorer. Poverty is both a cause and a consequence of inequality. And poverty is bad for the economy as well. It's a death knell of inclusion and equity. The political cost of poverty is even much more staggering. Inequality threatens public conviction in democracy and its several institutions. And that's the big picture math, friends. Some of you must be wondering, where's your 100,000 gone? Before you raise it up, let's find out what can 100,000 rupees do to the people who are not sitting here in the auditorium. What can 100,000 mean? to a farmer who's on the verge of committing suicide because he's lost his crops to the rain gods and is convinced and he's convinced that inequality is creeping into the next generation as well what does 100000 mean to an aged couple who have no money and no health benefits what does 100000 mean to the young housewife over the last 7 decades India has emerged as the third largest economy in purchasing power parity. 
growing at a healthy 7% or so. Our contribution to global growth is no less flattering. We have accounted for about 10% of all growth in economic activity across the world in the last 10 years or so. Our positive demographic indicators as well as a healthy democracy are the other highlights. We are in a sweet spot, friends, and the envy of the developed world. This should make us all happy. The numbers don't lie. Two days back, the human development rank was revealed, and we are still at 130. At the current rate of growth, we will take another 20 years to be in China's neighborhood, which itself is lowly ranked. This rank of 130 tells a grim story. But let, let me tell you, it's a fairly accurate indicator of where we are. Let me tell you some other figures. India is home to about 45% of the deprived, a term used by the UNDP for the less fortunate who suffer from multi-dimensional poverty. They are malnourished, uneducated, employed, and live a life of misery. And they number about half a billion people. They mostly live in the hinterland, a place known to each one of us. It's called Bharat. They have neither participated in the Indian growth story nor hope to. They just stand and wait outside the inclusive purview. There's no dignity in distress. Credit Suisse report says it well in numbers. Today, 10% of Indians own more wealth than 70% of the rest of the people. The super rich, that 1%, own close to about 50% of India's wealth. Can these issues be wished away? Let's also discuss about why have we been running away from the universal basic income concept. How can it be implemented? And why should it be implemented? We're also going to talk about if this really indeed is the magic bullet. In the meanwhile, let me share with you our experience of working with about 250,000 people across 400 districts in the last seven years. And it's taught us more than the several interactions that I have with the policymakers, with the corporate gurus that I work with. Our work has taught us that 85% of Indians are in debt. Paradoxically, no bank has given them that loan. 80% of the poor will lose their entire life saving if one of their family member is hospitalized. We've also learned that a financially independent woman can change the fate of an entire generation. We've learned that in India, two segments matter most. And I call them the Jawan and the Kisan. They relate to poverty, skill, employment, hunger, and several others. We've also learned over the last seven, eight years, working with these 250,000 people, that our education system is in a vicious cycle. We have a copybook demographic, but this is turning out to be demographic disaster because just to capitalize on this demographic dividend, we need to create a million jobs every year for the next 20 years. And how do we do that? We have a labor force which has poor skills, inadequate technique, and little knowledge. The government's effort in skill development is a good idea, is a good intent, but badly implemented. There's a new concept coming up. It's called entrepreneurship or self-employed. I call them the reluctant entrepreneurs. Over the last seven decades, self-employment has been the last recourse of the unemployed. If you can't find a job, try to become self-employed. 
and as they fail because of the lack of knowledge, the lack of skill, the lenders and other collaborators and enablers, they tend to suffer as well. Most of you can probably understand that all these issues that we talked about are in some way the cause and the effect. Most of them are both. Certainly all of them are intertwined. We also learn that agriculture has many more people than it needs. And the feeders to the nation are malnourished. Do I need to say anything more? Feeders to the nation are malnourished. Policymakers debate with me and mention, why are you so upset? Is our growth not adequate enough? The right question should be, is our growth inclusive? Is our growth inclusive? The Prime Minister's aim towards inclusive growth is laudable. And the vehicle he has chosen is through centrally sponsored welfare schemes. In my view, he's probably riding the wrong horse. A few months back, we heard the finance minister announce an outlay of 200,000 crores for rural development and agriculture alone. This is over several such announcements. Every social scheme has been announced. Do we see any difference? The policymakers have good advisors, but I think they have better copywriters. They sell these schemes really well. These schemes include housing, food, shelter, poverty, and, and, and. Every possible scheme has been announced. Still, close to about 50% of Indians can't have two square meals a day. A recent government study said this well, that 12 of the largest poverty eradication programs have been a failure. Now let's come back to UBI. UBI is forward. The idea of universal basic income is not new. Over the last 200 years, several governments have ushered in basic income by building a cradle to the grave welfare states. The economy and the business flirted with minimum wages, insurance, and retirement funds. The capitalism's inability to provide a decent standard of living for the poor has been its most glaring inadequacies. The communists have measured themselves by a lower and less tangible standard, and that is intent. For some of you who think UBI is a new concept, let me share with you that in the 18th century, a philosopher, a shrewd one, called Thomas Penn, urged the government to pay 15 pounds to every citizen. He was bartering to build private property rights. Some of the erudite listeners here may be aware that a basic form of UBI is already in practice in Alaska for the last 35 years. Similar experience is underway in countries like the Netherlands, Finland, and in Brazil as well. Is the UBI the magic bullet? Now, what can UBI really do for everybody? The universal income will help build an ecosystem for the poor to march out of the poverty trap. There are many more benefits, like providing everyone a life of dignity. They all seem like a good reason for us to pledge at least some part of our income to the 65% of the Indians who are abandoned. To me, UBI is buying the poor out of poverty, plain and simple. Let's buy them out of poverty. I've also been confronted by policymakers about can we afford it? And this is the question most of you must be asking here. Can we afford UBI? A back of the envelope calculation clearly indicates that dismantling and disassembling the thousand welfare schemes that we have, doing away with the non-merit subsidy that some of us are entitled to, tinkering with the defense budgets, and doing away with the outlays for the corporate sector should easily do it. Eradicating corruption and building an efficient system 
will only add to the threshold. Here is the key. Let's rethink India, where the farmers are not malnourished, where the housewife is not distressed about the next meal for the family, where entrepreneurship is not the last recourse, but the first choice of every young person. In my view, UBI implementation is not economic, but political. Most policymakers ask me, can we really afford this? And I tell them, the right question is, can we afford not to? It's not if. It's not if, but when. If Mahatma Gandhi was alive today, he would give it much more than a nod. He will approve it, he will endorse it, and he will make sure that it's implemented. Thank you so much.